Good morning. We're glad that you're joining us today. Always know that you're welcome to join us in person at MCC. And also, if you want to find out more information about MCC, check, it, check us out online. Let's get ready to hear the message for today. We hope it's a blessing and encouragement to your life. Uh, hey, uh, we're glad you're here this morning. For those of you who don't know, my name is Sean Bitzer, and uh, if you're joining us in Fall City or Independence, we're glad you're joining us this morning, that we get to be a part of uh, worshiping God together through the studying of His Word together. Um, uh, when I was working on today's sermon, I, I had this thought, I'm not really a big one into titles, I don't really do a lot of titles with sermons, um, but if I had a title, this would be the title of the sermon. Is Jesus... The God of Palm Sunday or the God of Easter Sunday? Is Jesus the God of Palm Sunday or Easter Sunday? If you have your Bibles, John 12. Today, if you don't know, if you're not real familiar with church or with church tradition, today is what's called Palm Sunday. And it's called Palm Sunday because the story has a lot of palm branches. So we could have called it Donkey Sunday but that doesn't quite have the same ring, especially if you use the KJV version. Um, so, Palm Sunday, John 12, verse 12. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the, in, in the seat back in front of you, and uh, um, you can follow along with us. It says this, John 12, 12. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast... When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at first, but when Jesus was glorified, when they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him, so the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify about him. For this reason also the people went and met him because they heard that he had performed signs. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that... You see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. So Palm Sunday is this day where Jesus enters into Jerusalem for what will be the final time before the cross. Jesus has been to Jerusalem before, but he's coming in Jerusalem. Passover is coming. It's just a few days away from Passover. In fact, Jesus is crucified on Friday. And if you remember, they take, him, they take them all down because they don't want to leave them up for the Passover celebration that begins at sundown on Friday of that week. And so this is just five days before Jesus goes to enter in. Jesus has been doing his ministry for three years now. Incredible things, right? You remember, it mentions Lazarus. It's one of my favorite stories because it's just hilariously amazing, right? Lazarus is dying. You remember the story? Lazarus is dying, and, and uh, some people come to him and say, hey, your friend whom you love, Lazarus, is dying. Come and heal him, because Jesus has done that, right? He's touched people, and he's healed them. In fact, if you remember, there's the woman with the issue of bleeding, and he doesn't even touch her. She touches the hem of his garment, and she's healed. So they come to him with hope that he's going to do something and do something mighty and do something incredible. And, and so they come to him and, and he, it says this, he says, uh, it says, then he chose to wait two more days and Lazarus dies. And they journey to go see Lazarus' tomb and they find Lazarus' tomb. And then this is the thing I love about the story. It says this, it says, Jesus says these words, Lazarus, come out. And in one of my favorite comments I've ever read in a commentary, one commentator said he had to use the word Lazarus because if Jesus just said, come out, every dead person in that hill would have come walking out of the hill. <laughs> Can you imagine? 
Like Jesus, like I know Jesus didn't mess up, he didn't fail, he never sinned, all that kind of, but can, can we just imagine? Like he just forgets that one line, and he's like, oh, whoa, 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 no, 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 oh, you back, back, go back, right? They're like, oh, right? Bad episode of The Walking Dead, as they all just have to climb back into their holes in the hill. And Lazarus comes alive. A man who was dead, wrapped up, he's been dead long enough, they're worried that he's going to stink, and that Jesus speaks into existence. It reminds me back of Genesis. Genesis 1, God speaks, and it was. And the fullness of this power is dwelling in Jesus as God. The fullness of this power is running through him to where he can speak things and they happen. It's incredible. It's incredible. He's been doing this for three years. And crowds have been building and crowds have been building and crowds have been building. And it comes the time where Jesus is going to come to his, his moment of glorification. And for him, he knows what that looks like. That looks like the cross. It looks like the flesh being ripped off of his back. It looks like a crown of thorns with big old nasty crown, uh, thorns jammed onto his head. It looks like him carrying his cross out to the hill. It looks like him being, um, having nails driven through his, his wrist. His, in, in, in Greek, it says the, the hand, but the hand in Greek, in Greek ideology, is anything below the elbow. So like this all is your hand in Greek thought. Okay? And so they drive the nails through between these two bones before they meet there. And um, they say that there's a, a, your nerves that go out to your hands run through between those bones because God made it that way to protect the nerves that run out to your hand because your hands are kind of important. And so when you would drive a nail through, they said that it would cause such excruciating pain as if the hand was constantly being severed. Right? And it would seize up from its pain, and, and they put his feet on top of one another, and they drive a nail through his ankles. Jesus knows that this is coming. But the crowds, the crowds, the disciples, they know Jesus is going, and they know that he's going for the moment of glorification. They know that he's the Messiah. They know that there's something coming, and they're expecting. I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the prophecy even says this. Behold, your king is coming. So they're waiting for a king to come, riding in on donkey. Now, a donkey seems like a weird thing to <laughs> ride in on, right? It's like kind of like we're going to... We're going to celebrate the victory of the Indy 500 by driving a Prius around. It's kind of, wait, 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 whoa, huh. But here's the thing. Romans, when the Romans would celebrate, they'd created a tradition. They'd created a tradition where um, the conquering general would ride into Rome to be celebrated by the Caesar or by the government to have these accolades, and he would ride in on a donkey. And the picture here for Romans, the reason they started doing this is because, yeah, they thought they could ride in on a big white steed and they could be big and tall up on this big beautiful horse and the tail coming flying out and they could have all this decoration, but it would distract. And the idea was that they could come riding in on this little donkey and they could make a statement of say, I am so powerful. And I am so impressive that I can conquer my army, my, my enemies on a donkey, right? So Jesus, Jesus comes in fulfilling prophecy that God knew this was going to happen, but painting a really clear picture to the Romans and everybody oppressed by the Romans, because when the Romans would oppress the Israelites, Guess what the, what, the, what the general would ride into Rome to celebrate his victory over the Israelites? You remember in 70 AD Israel, you may not know this, but in 70 AD Israel is crushed. There's a rebellion in 70 AD, and um, uh, it is like Josephus is an ancient historian, Jewish historian, and he writes about it, and uh, they, they just talk about how excruciatingly uncomfortable and brutal it was how the roads were dyed red with the blood of children, right? 
And they just went around and they just crushed the heads of it. And they burned things. And they burned, like, just literally burned stone. Just to, just, to, just to crush out this rebellion. And then you know what happened? After the victory, the general went to Rome to be congratulated by the Caesar for his maintaining peace in his empire. And he rode in on a donkey. So Jesus... Jesus comes to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, going into this moment where the whole world is going to change. Everything about life and reality is going to change in this moment on the cross. And Jesus goes riding in on a donkey. And the crowds cheer. Wow! I don't know if you're a big sports fan, but um, this last week... uh, Spring games have started for football. Amen? Yeah. March Madness is over. We got the NBA Finals coming. That's good news. Like in June or July or September, whenever their season ends and their seven years of playoffs that they have. And then we're just stuck with baseball. (laughs) But... Spring football games have started. Yesterday, Clemson, reigning national championship in college football, Clemson had their spring game. You know how many people showed up at their spring game? Nothing compared to Alabama, but that's because in Alabama they got nothing else to do but look at trees and watch football. So Clemson, 60,000 people showed up. They said it was like a home rivalry game. There's their seating capacity in their stadiums, like 67,000. The whole place was packed for a spring game. Have you ever watched a spring game? I played football. Spring games are boring. They're bad football. You get the like freshman who doesn't know what he's doing out there playing wide. It's just bad football, right? 60,000 people showed up. You know how many people showed up the year before to Clemson's football game? Spring football game? 11. Not 11 people, 11,000, but that would have been better if there was just 11 people there. (laughs) There's like 120 people on the team and the staff, and there's 11 people in the stands. (laughs) Mom, you can come down here, right? But see, here's the thing. Here's Here's what I was thinking about as we were coming on Palm Sunday. It's easy to cheer in the crowd. When your football team is the national champion, it's easy to root for them. Right? It's easy to take time out of your Saturday and go and sit and watch bad football because then you can say, I, I was a part of that. I watched that. Clemson, woo! I mean, I just bought the t-shirt last week, but woo! Right? It's easy to be a fan. We, we say this in sports, right? In the sports world. Um, you say this. I say this. Right? Like, let's talk about the Blazers. <laughs> what a disappointing season. Okay? They're fighting for the eighth spot, which, let's just be honest, is not worth fighting for. But that's a whole different conversation. They're fighting for the eighth spot. And here's here's what we say. When they were doing great last year, we made the playoffs. And then when they lose, we go, well, I mean, they didn't play very well. They lost the game. Do you notice what changed there? We won. They lost. It's easy. It's easy to cheer and celebrate when you're part of the winners. It's easy. I would imagine, I imagine this moment when Jesus comes walking in and and he's on the donkey and all the celebration that comes along with the conquering king or general entering into his city. This is Jerusalem. This is the city for the Jews. And he comes riding in with all the symbolism of a conquering king. And he comes in and they celebrate and they cheer and they're they're waving palm branches. And they've seen him do incredible things. And they believe. They're confident and they're hopeful. And they go running out with their friends and their neighbors to go wave palm branches. And they're rejoicing and celebrating. But there's another story that happens. There's another story that happens. If you have your Bibles, turn forward to John 19. (laughs) 
John 19, verse 38 is where we're going to be. It says this in verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being the disciple of Jesus, oh, what, watch this, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted, granted permission so he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture, mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linens, wrapping with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. There's a weird thing that happens in five days. The crowds cheer, woo, Jesus, woo, Jesus, we're going to kick them, we're going to whoop those Romans, woo, and in five days, who comes looking for Jesus? Who comes to find him? Not Peter. I mean, Peter walked on water. You remember that story? Peter walked on water. Like, okay, you have friends, tell stories, confession, I could be this person, that one-up you in all stories, right? You're like, oh, I went to a Blazers game and I sat in the fourth row, and they're like, well, I sat in the first row, right? Always one-up. Like, Peter never gets one-up. They're like, well, I mean, I walked on a tightrope between the, across the Empire State Building, uh, you know, however many hundreds of feet up in the air, and Jesus like, I walked on water. What now? Right? Jesus is crucified, dead, waiting. Here's what would have happened to Jesus' body traditionally as a thief. Not as a thief, as a criminal who'd been crucified. He'd been thrown into a pile. His body would have been tossed out, likely into a place called the Valley of Kindron, He'd be tossed out into place. Jesus uses an illustration when he talks about the flames of hell that they're never ignited because it was basically their city dump and they would take the body and they would dump it out there. And when Jesus dies, everyone flees. Peter's not there. John's not there. You remember there's this thing called the transfiguration, which is still kind of like a weird, crazy, hard to grasp our mind around thing. But there's this moment where Jesus is there with three of his disciples, one of them being John, and the, the, it says that there was this transfiguration. The word that it uses is the same word that it uses to talk about when a um, caterpillar becomes a butterfly, this metamorphosis. There's this changing of Jesus to where um, the disciples, the three disciples, are able to see the fullness of God's glory in him, and, and he's standing there um, with some Old Testament heroes, and, and he sees this. And when Jesus is dead, there's no cheering. Well, I mean, there was. You remember? The day before, the crowds, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And I wonder, I wonder this morning, in your life, is Jesus... Is Jesus just the God of Palm Sunday for you? When everything's awesome, right? When we're winning, when life is good, when your marriage is awesome, when your kids are obeying and they're not in detention or in trouble with the police or running from the Lord, when things are going well, right? In those moments, do you stand up with the crowd and you say, Jesus, woo! But is Jesus, is Jesus just the God of Palm Sunday for you? What happens when things go south? What happens when you've had a hard day? Or maybe, like, let's be honest, when you run out of coffee in the morning. No? I mean, I don't know about you, but I see the fullness of my sinfulness exposed in that moment. And I want to ask you this morning, 
I mean, it's easy. It's easy to follow Jesus when the crowds chant his name. It's easy to be out one, one with a palm branch, waving a palm branch, celebrating Jesus. It's easy to sing songs rejoicing in Jesus. It's easy when, we're, when we were a nation of 80% Christians. It was easy. I'm sure you've seen the stats, you've seen clickbait of fear-mongering, and I'm not trying to be fear-mongering at all. I'm just hoping to, as your pastor to prepare you for the reality that we are not and we are quickly becoming even less and less and less a nation of Christians. And when you're the minority, maybe even the minority in your own family, when you're the minority, when everybody else has left, will Jesus still be God in your life? I ask this question not because I want to stir up guilt in you. Like, that's a lie. Like, I don't... I don't I don't want you to hear like me sitting up here going, you're a horrible person. I mean, if you were just as godly as I am, right? But he, here's, the, here's the thing. I, I want us to be honest this morning because honesty is where it has to start. My fear for so many of us, so many of us, particularly in America, in our suburban lifestyle is that we will go through life with Jesus, simply the God of Palm Sunday, and it will be insufficient. It will be insufficient for you to experience the fullness of joy in Jesus. It will be insignificant for God to move in mighty and powerful ways. It will be insignificant for God to actually do anything to transform or to fulfill the words that we have written on our lobby here that say, um, that said, Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. And that we would just float through life. If you've ever read much about like 12-step programs... Right, in 12-step programs, the first thing that you have to do in a 12-step program is admit that you have a problem. And this morning on Palm Sunday, next Sunday when it's Easter, how easy it is to show up to church on Easter. Right? Like I joke, if your grandma owns a Bible, you go to church on Easter. It's what we do. It's part of Americana. Right? But maybe this morning... Can we just be honest with ourselves? There's a quote that I love, and it says this, it's okay to not be okay, it's not okay to be a liar. And I want to tell you that, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to say that, like, I struggle with trusting Jesus. It's okay to say, like, I find myself consumed by my own brokenness more often than not. I find myself doubting and struggling to really believe that this really matters. I struggle with apathy. I struggle with guilt and shame from decisions that I've made throughout my life. But maybe this morning, maybe this morning, maybe in this moment, when we are amongst the crowd, when we are standing and singing, I mean, in a little bit, we're going to stand up and we're going to sing songs proclaiming the goodness of God and the righteousness of Jesus and his love displayed to us. We're going to sing all. Maybe in this moment, could we, could we maybe in this moment have an honest moment? The, the people who celebrated Jesus on Palm Sunday largely found nothing else. The people, the people who are willing to stand, think of later Peter stands before the Sanhedrin, he stands before people who are, who are threatening to kill him, they can't kill him, but they're threatening to kill him, and they're going to beat him, and they do beat him at different points in times, and he stands before, and he's faithful, and he sees God move in incredible ways. And he finds joy and freedom from all of his brokenness and all of his guilt and all of his shame. And I want to ask you this morning, is Jesus more to you than just the God of Palm Sunday? See, here's the thing. Jesus ends up on the cross on Friday. 
All the sins of all of humanity laid upon him, crucified, paid in full, that we might have the free gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God's love displayed for us in the fullness and the cross. But the real power of Jesus' ministry doesn't begin until Sunday. Jesus spent three years doing awesome things. But it's Sunday where life change happens. It's Sunday where life is granted. It's Sunday where freedom is given. It's Sunday where bondage is broken. It's Sunday where a new future is given. It's Sunday where condemnation is wiped away. It's Sunday where the words are fulfilled that there is no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And this morning, this morning, if you find yourself, you've been living a life where Jesus has been the God of Palm Sunday. He's been the God of when it's convenient and when it's comfortable and when it's nice and when it fits. I plead with you. Come before the Lord. Find the Jesus of Friday. Find the Jesus of Sunday that you might experience and find the fullness of life in Christ Jesus. Will you pray with me? Lord, We thank you this morning for your goodness. We thank you this morning for the cross. We thank you for your resurrection. We thank you for the gift that you even gave your son. That that on that day, 33 years before the cross, that, that God was born. Emmanuel, God with us. That God dwelt among us. That he lived among us. Lord, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. And this morning, Lord, I ask that you would move in mighty ways in our hearts, that we would be able to be honest this morning, that there would not be guilt or condemnation, but that there'd be freedom, that there'd be freedom to lay down our masks, that there'd be freedom to lay down our worries, there'd be freedom to lay down our burdens, and that we would find trust and redemption, and restoration, and forgiveness, and that we would find rejoicing, for you are the God of Sunday. You are the God of Easter Sunday. You are the God of resurrection. You are the God of life. You are the God of freedom. You are the God of newness. And for that, we worship and exalt you. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.